Welcome to Sound Walls 101. I am Michelle Trosel. I'm excited to spend a little bit of time with you today talking about sound walls. I've been talking to a lot of my colleagues over the last year or two about sound walls. And what I hear over and over again is, Michelle, I get it. I totally agree with you. I think sound walls are wonderful, but there's a huge problem. I wasn't taught as a beginning reader about the sounds of English. I wasn't taught in my um, college work to become a teacher about the sounds of English. I'm not really sure what the sounds are. Like I can fake it well enough to teach my phonics program, um, but what you're asking here is a lot. I, I'm not comfortable, I'm not confident, I'm not really sure how the sounds work, um, and I, I really don't know how to teach the sounds to students and, and sound like I know what I'm talking about. So um, hopefully I'll be able to help a little bit with that today. So we have some goals um, for our time together. We're going to discuss the uh, articulatory features of sounds. Um, we're going to identify how you place sounds on a sound wall, and then we'll explore some opportunities to use the sound wall to support students. All right, so first it's important that we agree on some language here. It, it's important that we are using correct language to uh, explain what we mean and that we are all having the same understanding of the vocabulary we're using. So first and foremost, vowels and consonants are sounds. They're not letters, okay? Um, letters represent those sounds. Letters do not make the sounds. So when we talk to students about this sound, we can say this sound, which is represented by these letters. We don't say, here's the letter T and it makes the sound T. That's not as accurate. Um, a phoneme is the proper word for a sound. A phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. And then graphemes are the letter or letters that represent that sound. So you'll hear me use the words phoneme and grapheme um, throughout this presentation. There are actually 44 sounds in the English language. So 44 phonemes. Um, there's a little bit of discussion among those that are, you know, the absolute experts. Um, but generally, uh, there can be agreement in those 44 sounds. And then each of those sounds can be represented by one, two, three, or even four letters, so graphemes. Um, for example, in the word cat, the a ah sound is represented by one grapheme, the letter A. Uh, in the word neighbor, the A sound is represented by four letters, the grapheme E-I-G-H, okay? So um, th it can be really tricky knowing uh, when we represent phonemes with certain graphemes. Uh, and then talking about precision in instruction uh, related to the sounds of English, we need to clip the schwa. Schwa is the sound uh, uh that is typically the vowel in an unaccented syllable. But let me give you an example of when we need to clip the schwa. So oh, some people will hold up a letter T and say, this letter represents the sound T. No, it doesn't. It represents the sound T. That uh at the end of T is a schwa. We need to clip it, get it out of there. Uh, we tend to do this when we're trying to uh, project our voice to the back of the room. And in these days of wearing masks, that's going to be even more uh, tempting to try to really project volume and the way you get volume is by adding that vowel sound, uh, um, but then we're not being precise in the sounds that are being represented um, by the different letters. And that can be really confusing for students when they then go to write the word tub and they're like, tuh, uh, buh. And then you see how you can end up with, you know, way too many sounds in there. So get rid of that schwa, clip that schwa, and just um, allow students to hear the sounds. All right, so English, some people say English is crazy. It's totally not crazy. English is what we call morphophonemic. Sometimes we spell by meaning, morpho. Sometimes we spell by sound. That's where the phonemic part comes in. So once we know when we're spelling by meaning and when we're spelling by sound, uh, that can explain a lot of what people consider to be um, those crazy parts of English. So Hannah, Hannah, Hodges, and Rudorf discovered this way back in 1966 uh, when they figured out that 
50% of words are, are decodable just with that phonemic part of language. Um, but then you add in, in the, uh, we have 34% of words are decodable for varying of one sound. And if you know all of those expectancies for morphophonemic parts of language, only 4% of word spellings are true oddities. Words like yacht. Why do we spell yacht? Y-A-C-H-T? I don't know. Um, that's just how it is. But I, I wanted to give you an example of a word that would be decodable um, except for one sound. Uh, so in our attempt to teach high frequency words to students, um, one of those high frequency words would be said. Uh, when I taught first grade, I taught my students, here said, S-A-I-D, you just have to memorize it. Well, that's not really true. Um, when we think of the word said, we have three sounds, s-e-d. The s is represented by the letter s, just the way we would expect. The d is represented by the letter d, just like we would expect. But then that e sound in the middle, e, we would expect the letter e, but in the word said, we spell that sound with the letters a, i. If we just explain that to students, you know, they're, they're pretty, um, pretty adjustable. And, and they'll be like, okay, cool, so that's how it works. Um, and then they just move on. But giving them those anchors um, and explaining which parts of the word are directly decodable and which parts might be a little different um, really helps them to understand how our language works. So let's talk some more about sounds. When we are talking about sounds and learning about sounds, we talk about place and manner of articulation. So where in my mouth is this uh, sound happening? And what am I doing with my lips, my teeth, my tongue, my voice box? Um, so we're going to be thinking about lips. What are my lips doing when I make the sound? What are my teeth doing? How about my tongue? How is my tongue interacting with my teeth or my lips? Uh, what is my voice doing? Uh, I'll talk about brother sounds, sounds that are all of this, the place and man manner are the same, with the exception of your voice box either being turned on or turned off. And then how's the air flowing out of our mouth? Is it skinny air that's being forced out with a lot of friction? Is it a puff of air that's coming out and then stopping? How, how is that air flowing? So as we are focusing our instruction around these sounds, it's going to be really important for students to be able to see what your mouth is the teacher, what your mouth is doing, and to be able to see their own mouths so that they can um, compare what is my mouth doing compared to the picture of the mouth that is up on the, up on the sound wall. Um, how is this sound really being formed in my mouth? And so my recommendation would be that you get some small mirrors. I'm talking like the small ones that you know, come in the makeup compact. Uh, you can go on Amazon and get packs of those for about a dollar a piece. Um, you could get a larger mirror, uh, but then you run the risk of, you know, I mean, their kids, if they can see their whole face, they're gonna be making uh, silly faces in that mirror. A small mirror allows them just to focus on their mouth. Um, when you're doing this work for yourself, if you don't have a, a mirror handy, you could simply turn on the selfie mode on your phone um, and you can watch what your mouth is doing that way. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, made a joke um, about instruction these days, and, and maybe you should lay on your desk and have a document camera um, in front of, you know, sh putting your mouth up on the big screen so students can see. And while I wouldn't necessarily recommend laying on the desk to do that, if you can turn your document camera around, that's not actually a bad idea uh, to maintain a six feet of distancing from your students um, and yet be able for them to have an up close view of what happening uh, with your mouth when you're making these sounds. So uh, utilizing a document camera to be able to um, show those articulatory gestures up on the big screen. Hey, try it. All right, so let's move through to starting with consonant sounds. So here we have the consonant phoneme chart, which helps us to understand that place and manner of articulation. So we have the answers to all of those lips, teeth, tongue uh, types of questions up across the top row. And then down through the first column, we have the different types of sounds. And here you can see we'll have some unvoiced and voiced. And I'll explain more what that means when we get um, into the first section of sounds. So without any further ado, let's move on to stop sounds. 
Now, stop sounds um, are kind of fun because they are um, associated with this puff of air that comes out of your mouth. Sometimes I like to take a tissue and hold a tissue in front of a student's mouth and, and have them make a stop sound and they'll see that the tissue kind of dance. Um, here, here's a good uh, early elementary uh, joke for you. How do you make a tissue dance? Put a little boogie in it. Well, we're not gonna put little boogies in our tissues today, but we are going to make stop sounds that give a nice little puff of air. So I mentioned those brother sounds before. Here we have brother sounds, sounds where your voice box is turned off and sounds where your voice box is turned on. So we're going to start our stop sounds that we use our lips primarily. And the unvoiced uh, stop sound with our lips is Again, if you put your hand in front of your face, you can feel that puff of air. Make sure you're not saying puh, adding that schwa, clip the schwa. And then when you turn your voice box on, the sound becomes buh, buh, buh. Try those two. So there we have our lip stop sounds. And then when you put your, your um, your tongue sort of behind the, the ridge of your teeth, we get t, t, t as the unvoiced sound and d, d, d as the voiced sound. So try those stops, t, d, t, d. If you're having trouble um, feeling the vibration, you can try covering your ears, t, d. D. You can hear that voiced sound a lot louder when you are closing your ears than what you hear that unvoiced sound. Sometimes that will help students more than feeling their throat. And then if we move that sound back further in our throat, we have the unvoiced sound k, k, and then the voiced sound g, g. Now, one thing I should mention here are these slanted lines on either side of these letters. Those are called virgules, and they mean the sound of. So inside those virgules, we put the sound of, um, we put the letter that we typically represent with the sound. The reason why we use the letter, the letter K um, for the K sound and not a C is because uh, C goes back and forth between the hard and soft sounds. Um, K is more stable in representing the sound. And so there are the stops. Now we're going to move on to the nasal sounds. The nasal sounds you can feel vibrating inside your nose when you make the nasal sounds. So we have three nasal sounds. Uh, we call these cousin sounds. Um, so they're not as close as brothers. We don't have the voiced and unvoiced but they're all made in the same way, pushing that air through the nose. So when we put our lips together, we get the mmm sound. When we have our tongue behind the ridge of our teeth, we get the mmm sound. And then when the sound moves back further in our throat, we get the mmm, like in the end of the word sing. Mm, it's like a mm, sort of way back in there. It's a, a strange sound to make. You might need to practice that one for a little bit. Um, and you know what's great about kids is they're so forgiving. So, you know, if you mess up, it's okay. It's not that big of a deal. Go back and talk it through with them. Feel, um, feel the air coming through your nose. Uh, feel where the sound is in your mouth and work together uh, to figure that out, that mm, sound. Um, one thing I want to really point out with the nasals is they, they don't play well with uh, vowels. So when we have a word like an, when you see an A, you would expect a, ah, but that nasal sound, when you co-articulate the a ah and the n, mm, it sort of pulls ah into your nose and nasalizes it. So you have that am um, instead of an. Um, so that's why we need to be careful when we're asking kids to segment words. It's usually a good idea to keep those nasals out of there um, because
because the sound, uh, we use foundations in my district and I call those glued sounds. The way that it co-articulates the vowel up and through the nose sort of glues it into there and it alters the vowel sound slightly. So be aware of, of those nasal sounds and how they can be tricky for students. Okay, we're gonna move on to the fricatives. Uh, the fricatives have a lot of vibration in them and they have, uh, most of them have what we call more of a skinny air. So the air is being forced um, through in more of a skinny way and you'll see that once we get to the sounds. Fricative has a lot of friction in it. So again, in the fricatives, we have um, some brother sounds. So when you put your teeth on your lips, and don't turn on your voice box. We have a quiet sound. We have, and you can see what I mean by that skinny air. There's just a little bit of space for the air to force its way out. And then you turn your voice box on and you have So uh, that would be the teeth, lips, uh, brother sounds and fricatives. Uh, then when you put your tongue between your teeth, you have unvoiced and so the line under the th indicates that you turn your voice box on so it's something like this thumb this is the voice sound thumb you're not turning your voice box on so that's the subtle difference between the unvoiced and voiced fricatives uh, using your tongue between your teeth and then when we put our tongue up behind the ridge of our teeth again, we have and zzz. Uh, then the sound moves back in your mouth a little further and you end up with shh and zzz, like in treasure. Um, so they're shh and zzz, shh, zzz. Or you can close your ears and hear the difference. And then uh, this is all the way back in the glottis area. You have that not ha ha. It's an unvoiced sound. Um, in again, in trying to make your voice louder so that all the students can hear, uh, we sometimes. Um, make it louder and add that schwa to try to get some, some more volume out of it. Um, try not to do that. So those are the fricatives. Uh, the next sound category we have are the affricates. Uh, the affricates are kind of like a cross between a fricative and a stop. So the air comes out kind of skinny, then it gets fat, like it's, it's like a fat air. So there's some vibration, but it's, it's more of a fat pushed air. And we have two affricates. Um, we have, ch -ch -ch. you can feel again, how it's like a stop in that the puff of air comes out. There's also a lot of vibration in there, um, similar to the fricative. So the affricate, ch and then j for the voiced, j, ch, j. Right. And those are our two super quick affricates. Now we're on to the glides. The glides are very airy and it feels like they just glide right out of your mouth. So we have um, an unvoiced that we don't use um, very often in American English. It's more common in British English. Um, and then we have the voiced like in wagon and water. Um, you'll notice that these sounds are both in the lips category and the back of the throat category. Uh, the sound starts in the back and you're really using your lips to help articulate that sound. And, um, and then we have the y sound like in yellow um, where you're pushing that sound up through the roof of your mouth sort of and and out through y, 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 y. That one's hard to get that schwa off of. You gotta practice that one quite a bit, that y sound. Okay. So those are your glides. Then we have uh, two liquid sounds. 
um, liquids. We have a glass of water here because these liquid sounds, they feel like they just fill your mouth up like a, like a good uh, swig of water. You know, it just fills your mouth all up, just sort of rolls around in there. So our two liquid sounds are that old sound and then the er sound. Similar to the nasals, um, these sounds like to attach to those vowels and when we co-articulate, they tend to really take over and alter the sounds of those vowels. So we need to uh, really watch how we're teaching our young students um, so that we're not giving them words that aren't really appropriate to be breaking um, the, the sounds apart um, in a way that feels unnatural um, in, our, in our speech. So we have, again, for the liquids, we have that ooh, and then uh, 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 not er, uh. yeah, see, I, I, you know, this is tough stuff, guys, this really is. And, you know, we need to work together and encourage each other. Again, perfection is not what we're going for. Uh, we're going for helping students to be able to uh, clearly understand the sounds and then how those sounds map onto letters so that we can read and write efficiently. Ooh, are your liquid sound. All right, it's vowel time. Who's excited? I'm excited. Uh, vowel time, here we go. So uh, English vowel phonemes by order of articulation. I don't know about you, um, but when I first started teaching can, uh, first grade, I taught my students that there were five vowels, A, E, I, O, U. Oh, well, you know, sometimes Y is a vowel. Well, and then that A, E, I, O, U, they have a short sound and a long sound. So there's kind of like 10, maybe 11. Well, when you count schwa, there are actually 19 vowel sounds. So it's really important that we um, be clear with students, that we understand this ourselves, and that we be clear with students and help them to understand um, how the vowel sounds in English work. Now, there is a very specific uh, reason why these boxes, uh, which represent vowel sounds are arranged in the way that they are. Um, we, we, this uh, mimics the motion of your chin. So when we're making all of the vowel sounds, our chin starts very high and then comes down very low and then goes back up high again as the sound moves from the front of our mouth to the back of our mouth. Then we have some other uh, vowel sounds that are sort of outliers, which is why they're not along um, the, the chin valley, or we call this sometimes vowel valley. All right, so here's vowel valley all filled in. Um, again, we have schwa up here hanging out all by itself because, you know, it's just a little different. Um, and then we start here with a nice, you can put your hand under your chin, a nice high smiley ee. That's why uh, when photographers want to take your they say cheese it has that long e sound in there that gives you that nice high smiley uh, look to your face e and then our chin goes down a little bit and we have the i sound i like in sit and gym then we have the a sound e sorry e i a e a Eh, ah, eh, ah. See how similar those two are? Eh, ah. And your chin goes down a little bit more with ah. And then we have I and ah. So when you go to the doctor's office and to see your throat, they ask you to say that ah sound. That's a short O sound, ah. And then we come back up as our chin starts to come back up again with a, uh, ah. O, U, like in took, U. Then we have U, like tube, and U, like cute. See how my chin comes way up and my, my mouth sort of comes forward and the sound comes back in my mouth. Uh, then we have our R controlled vowels over here, er, R, or. And then over here we have oi and ow. Now you'll notice that I have lots of different words underneath each of these um, to uh, illustrate the different spellings that we um, could have for all of these sounds. I would not recommend starting a school year 
with something like this on the wall. I, I just, it's too overwhelming for anybody. So at the beginning of the year, what I would have on the, on the wall the first day students came in was my Val Valley all built, but with the cards turned backwards so that students aren't seeing it. And then we would build together. So uh, in the early grades, uh, we start with those short vowel sounds. So I flipped them all over for you here. Um, but when I introduce short vowels, see how close eh and a ah are to each other? I'm not going to introduce those on the same day or even one after the other. I might start with i eh, and then a, ah, and then I might go to ah and eh, and then bring a uh in last, okay? So we want to um, introduce vowels in such a way that students can really feel that difference when they're beginning to learn, um, and then the more proficient they get, then we can um, introduce these vowels that are, are closer in um, articulatory features, okay? All right, so here I have an example of a consonant um, sound wall from a former colleague of mine, Tambra Eisenberg. She's fabulous. Look her up on, on Twitter. She's absolutely amazing. You can see uh, she did not put the consonant chart just the way um, we looked at it as teachers. Um, what she did was she, she did um, categorize together all of the stop sounds and then the affricates, and she put those nasals together. But students can see the, the brother sounds, and they can see the cousin sounds, and um, notice the similarities um, in those sounds, and, and the very small differences in how to differentiate one from the other. So maybe this is um, a way that it would be helpful for you and your students to organize a consonant wall in your classroom. You can see she has, um, the, the letter that we typically associate um, as representing the sound. She has a picture of lips and what lips are doing, uh, what, what the lips and the teeth and the tongue are doing as you are um, making that sound. And then as a year progresses and different graphemes to represent that sound are introduced and those are added. And this is a great way for students to be able to reference um, the, the phonemes and the graphemes as they go throughout the year. And then here's the completed vowel valley. So you can see again with each um, letter, there's a picture of a mouth making that sound um, to help students identify the sound. Uh, and then uh, different graphemes um, in the order of frequency in which those graphemes are typically um, used. So, how do we use a sound wall in the classroom? Well, some uses are to reinforce that English is a speech to print language. When you have a word wall, that is print to speech. So every word that starts with an S goes under the letter S, even though uh, we typically think of S as representing s a word like she doesn't make the s sound. So that can be confusing to students um, because we are speech to print, not the other way around. We learn to talk before we learn to read. Um, helping students to match the graphemes to the phonemes, like I said. And uh, there's a, a document that you'll have access to that helps you to see the percentage of use. Um, one thing that I like to point out is the shh sound. We always teach students that is represented with sh and that is true at the beginning of words but the most frequent spelling for the sh sound is actually ti like in station vacation um, so ti is the most frequently used grapheme for sh but that is that comes in the middle of words sh typically uh, shows up at the beginning of a word uh, the sound wall is a great reference for independent writing. So when students are trying to write something in their journal or for an assignment and they want to write a word, but they're not sure what grapheme to use uh, for the sound that they hear, 
They could think about the features of that sound in their mouth. They could go to the sound wall, find the picture that represents that sound, and then they could look for graphemes that the class has together listed underneath that sound. Sound walls can also be used as a reference when you're reading an unknown word. You, know, you get to a word in a book and you're not sure um, what that word might be. You could look for the graphemes and, and then look for those on the sound wall to see if you can find a corresponding sound. Uh, we've been learning a lot about orthographic mapping and how um, the brain stores and learns words. And we know uh, that attaching the sounds um, to the, the letters um, is essential in students being able to learn and remember words that they can read them as if by sight. And having an anchor chart like a sound wall in a classroom really helps students to internalize uh, those features of of language um, so that they will be able to better store those words in their long-term memory. Um, this is just a sampling of ways that a sound wall can be used in the classroom. The most important um, part of having a sound wall is that it is something that you and your students are able to use um, as a reference, as a tool, um, as a way of learning and remembering uh, and how to break the code of English. So some resources that I used um, and that I suggest that you look into. Um, uh, the, the book Speech to Print, I have it right here. Uh, Speech to Print by Louisa Motes is a huge resource in understanding uh, how our language works and how we can help students to be increasingly efficient and effective uh, and confident and capable readers. Um, Pam Kastner, who is the Pennsylvania State uh, literacy lead with Patton. Um, she has amazing Padlets that she has put together. She has two actually on Soundwall. So I have linked in this presentation uh, the Soundwall resources Padlet and Soundwalls from the implementers. Uh, Tambra Eisenberg, who I mentioned in this presentation, um, has a section in that as well as other teachers um, who have been implementing Soundwalls with their students. And then uh, there's a wonderful app that you can get for free for Apple and Android devices called OG Card Deck. Uh, you can go through that and um, it will um, reference for you the articulatory features of sounds. Uh, if you have the volume turned up, you can actually hear the sounds um, and it will associate some graphemes for you as well. So check out that OG Card Deck app. Um, it would be a, a great tool to teach students how to use so that they can use it during away from the table activities um, or other times during the day. All right, well, I'm so glad that you spent some time with me um, learning about the sounds of English. Again, this is not something that is easy. This is not something that we were taught, um, but it is something that is worth working toward and uh, helping our students to become uh, confident and capable readers. If there's anything that I can do to support you in your journey, please reach out. Um, I look forward to hearing from you and working with you um, as you support your students in this incredible journey.